Okay, then. Good, good, good. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Stan, um, you know, I'm trying to work out. If I'm gonna, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to text Stav now to see if we can get him out of bed. Um, oh, no. You just sent me a message. You can't make it this week's sausages. Anyway, we'll do this anyway, right? So okay. um, I just, what I've got you is, is a little bit of a list, which we're going to share on the screen. Right. And, um, and we'll just, we'll just have a quick read. We'll have a read through this and, um, and, uh, and then, then we'll sort of have a little, little bit of a, a, a share on the screen. Right. So, so first thing first, before we sort of do a bit of a screen share, um, medieval weapons. Now, medieval weapons were there to maim, to sort of cause injury to, um, for an arm to be cut off or a leg to be cut off. Um, so you're hobbling around on a battlefield or <coughs> medieval weapons were principally there to kill. So when you, when you think about it, um, oh, very nice. in, 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 in many ways, uh, Dave, um, modern day weapons, um, should maim rather than kill, which, which is quite a strange thing, because years ago <clears throat> it was against it was against um, the Geneva Convention to actually have um, bullets that would explode. Um, there used there used to be bullets that were invented, which which are actually against the law. So when they would hit something, they, they would explode. So they're probably still out there, but apparently. That was outlawed. So modern day weapons, principally today, are there to maim rather than to outright kill. But in the in the medieval period, five hundred years ago, they were there to to maim or kill. So that's the difference between modern weapons and old weapons. But mind you, when you think about it, a bomb dropping would not kill you anyway. Anyway, but we're talking about bullets in that instance, which they didn't have in the medieval period. So. Oh, actually, until um, obviously we, we had a gunpowder being introduced and handguns into the 1400s and the 1500s. So, you know, so medieval weapons that maimed and killed swords and lances weren't the only weapons of choice during the bloody battles of the medieval period. And what, one of the most one of the most devastating battles, and I don't know if we've mentioned it, was the Battle of Towton. That was so absolutely horrific. Um, and I don't know if we've looked at the Battle of Towton. Um, but we might mention a little bit of it today if I don't get through everything anyway, because I want to do a little bit about the assassinations. We haven't got a massive amount of time today. So um, when we look at medieval warfare in Europe, we usually think about knights on, um, with, with their armour on the backs of horses, with their swords and the lances. But while these weapons were important, medieval warriors thrashed their opponents with an array of brutal instruments. So it wasn't about knights, it was about the foot soldiers and it was about the archers. Um, what we do find is that all the weapons that we do find described in the past, we can find buried in the ground on lots of battlefield sites, not just in Britain, but across the whole of Europe. A weapon's popularity depended on multiple factors including its effectiveness, status, and cost. Weapons back then were very, very expensive. Um, now, say that again? How much would they cost? Do, do, you, know, do you know what, right? I, I've, I've, I've heard this question, and I don't... I've heard this question before. And it said, if we want to talk about um, a knight on the back of a horse, right... The horse and all the armor and the sword would probably cost um, the same amount a very expensive four wheel drive would cost today. And I don't know if your dad has ever gone out wanting to buy a, a four wheel drive, but a brand new four wheel drive, something that could ride up to the tops of mountains and take you and the family out and all the rest of it would come close to about 50,000 pounds. And that's what we're talking about. Back in the day, uh, Fifty thousand pounds, Dave, is is the equivalent of um, buying a, a third of a house in the Ronda Valleys, or fifty thousand pounds is the equivalent of somebody who was earning a very good wage. That would be the the entire amount of money you'd get paid for the whole year. 
And that's before you've got to pay out for your food and your rent. That's that's all your money placed into all of this. Right. So and, and you could only do that if you were a knight, if you owned a lot of money. Somebody like you and me would would never be able to afford anything like that ever uh, in the medieval period, because in the medieval period, the average wage of somebody in the medieval period was about a pound. Start again was about a penny to two penny a day by about um, 1400 probably about two pence a day um, and you know that that's that wouldn't be enough to afford anything like this um, so you here we go they, they talk about they they um, they talk about they, they would have blood weapons which would which would wipe out an arm right um, an axe which would cut off an arm or a sword or something like a polax that was there to kill you um, so a sword, a polax is, is we're, we're gonna we, we've mentioned about a polax before, but we, we, we've got to look at a polax. So uh, what I've got is a nice little article here, and I'm just going to skim through it, and I'll just share. It. It's got a couple of images in it as well, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, but before we actually do that, we're going to look at uh, a polax, and I know we've looked at a polax before. I know we've done it, but. Uh, um, <clears throat> let's let's just type in Polax, right? And it, you know, let's just um, here we go. Um, a Polax. There we go. A Polax. Oh, that's the that we want an image, don't we? So uh, Polax. Uh, there we go. Now let, let's get a really nasty Polax. Oh, we love it. Um, let's just go with that. So what that is, do you see that little, so if you, if you look at the two, right, the one on the right, that's more like the, 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 right, let's get this right. The one on the right, that little tool on the left-hand side of the weapon on the right is like a hammer, right? Uh, the item on the left, the pole axe on the left, that is basically a very sharp blade. Now, the polax on the right is meant to sort of maim you. The polax on the left is meant to kill you. Right. And the way this would be used is this is used for foot soldiers. These are anti um, these are anti cavalry weapons. Now, on both of those polaxes, the spear, um, the the very sharp point is meant to be thrust towards you, right? Is meant to be thrust towards you. So that spike in front is meant to jab at you, right? Is meant to cause a wound. Is if you're on the horse, that's meant to take you off the horse, right? Or if that's somebody, you've got somebody in front of you, that's meant to wound you. Now, as you're going, oh, I'm dying! And you've dropped your sword and your shield or you've fallen off your horse, the next thing that comes at you is that axe there on the right-hand side of the both pole axes. That axe there is meant to take an arm off. That axe there is meant to take some of your armor off, yeah. right? Now, now, you've got those two pole axes. They both got different uses. If you want to injure the enemy on the ground and make them writhe on the ground, they're a knight in armor. armor. You don't want to kill them. You use the one on the right, right? As I say, medieval weapons were meant to either maim or kill. That's it. There's no middle way, right? So you had you had a weapon that was meant to kill or maim somebody to take out an arm. So if you wanted to capture a knight um, off a horse, you would use the polax on the right. You you would uh, you would use that there, uh, the hammer, to to break an arm or something to cause you to be in agony so you could be captured. The one on the the one on the left there, that spike would go through you and that would kill you. That would rip you open. You are dead. So those are those are the two polaxes. But what I want us to do is go back to that other image that we actually had. Let's just get into it. So uh, here we go. So I've got this little thing on the internet. Very very interesting thing. It talks about swords and lances. The single most important weapon in the medi medieval ages was the sword. But you know what, Dave? I would dis I, I would sort of disagree. I would say a polax is a lot more effective. A polax is is everything, right? But obviously, when you're up fighting up close, right, you use a sword. 
but I've said this before to you, Dave, right? If you're in a combat situation, right? If the enemy gets up too close, you're dead anyway, right? Do we remember when we did the other week and we looked at the Battle of um, um, Islam Dwana and, and, um, and, and Rourke's Drift? Um, if, if the enemy is upon you with, with an Asagai, i.e. the Zulu, or the enemy is, enemy is upon you um, with a bayonet, it's too late. It's already too late. You should have killed them by now. Um, a fast-moving weapon is basically um, a lance, right? Um, so there we go. That's a lance. And the sword delivered the most damage for least effect. But again, um, a you can only use a sword if you're good at using it. Um, <clears throat> if you're on the back of a horse, you use a lance. And you're meant, a lance is meant to clear the enemy, right? A spear, long, long spear is meant to clear the enemy for them to run away. So you don't need to use your sword. Then you drop the lance and you'd use your sword. But um, cavalry is only effective if you can get the enemy to run away. This is, this is why, Dave, this is why they would use, this is why um, in Africa, and India, they use the elephant because the elephant is meant to trample the enemy in the foot. But when you, you're too close to the elephant, you can you can damage the elephant and, and, and jabber its legs and the elephant will fall down and the people on it would be dead anyway. Um, so here we go. Um, it, it's, mentioning about, um, it's mentioning about the sword here. It gives hope that skill can triumph over brute force. A sword is only useful, Dave, if you're able to use it. If you're unable to use it, you, 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 you're, you're mucked up. There's no way you can do it. Can I just mention one thing? I don't know if you've heard of, of the Battle of Sedgemoor at the yeah. end of the 1600s. It, 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 was, it was the Monmouth Rising, right? Um, and it was basically between um, the Pretender uh, um, 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 and uh, the Duke of Monmouth and the king at that time, King James. Um, and basically, most of his army was armed with pitchforks and old fashioned swords and stuff. Well, if you go into battle with a pitchfork, a pitchfork is for using hay. If you go into battle with um, an axe, if you go into battle with, with a sword, right? If you're able to use that sword and a pitchfork, you're as deadly with somebody as a bayonet. You're as deadly with somebody um, with a firearm, right? But unfortunately, in that rising, these people were only able to use pitchforks to use against hay. They were unable to use them in a battle situation. So the Duke of Monmouth lost that battle because his, his soldiers weren't trained to fight. A weapon is as good as the person using it. But if the person is unable to use that weapon, they're going to die, right? Um, I don't care what anyone says. If you jump into a plane and you're unable to fly that plane, you, you, you're going to lose, right? But if you're able to use that plane as a fighter ace, uh, in the Gulf War or a fighter ace um, in the Second World War, you can be deadly. There were Iraqi aircraftmen in 1993 um, in the first Gulf War who actually um, were able to take down American planes. But then the Iraqi pilots in the Second Gulf War in 2003 weren't that well trained. So they weren't really able to take out American planes. So it's how good you are. It's how good you are. It's not the MiG fighter. It's not the hurricane in the Second World War. It's the person using it. And it's the same with a sword or a lance. There were other reasons for the sword's popularity. The limits of metalwork meant that swords, swords were inexpensive um, because the sword was a weapon suitable for um, wearing. That status could uh, be displayed both on and off the battlefield. So, so it's saying here that um, swords are inexpensive to create but again a good sword is an expensive sword a toledo sword from spain a samurai sword those are good swords again but if it if it's a really bad sword and you're able to use it then that, that that you know that's great dave that's that's absolutely great um it doesn't it doesn't really matter as i said if you're able to use the weapon and you're very good at using that weapon you are deadly can i give you an example of this right there was um um, there were there were there were women in the um, First World War, and there were women in the Napoleonic War. Um, in the Napoleonic War in Spain, um, they, they would have little daggers, 
um, and they would go to a pub and meet French officers. And they would say, oh, you know, um, look at me, I'm, I'm a good looking woman, right? When they went back to the officers' um, apartments where they were staying in Spain, they would take out a little knife and they would kill the Frenchman. Um, and the Frenchman wouldn't stand a chance. A tiny little knife against the man who was used to wear, using a sword and a firearms, right? But a little, little knife, she could kill that officer because she was good at using that little knife. And it's the same as French women um, who, were in, um, who were in captured territory on the German side in the First World War. They would do the same thing. It, it, it doesn't matter what weapon, it's how you use it. And this is, you know, this is how we believe that the British soldiers lost Islanduana. Uh, because even though they, they may have been good at firing, they weren't good in hand-to-hand -hand combat against the Zulu, the Asagai. Uh, you can imagine you've got this bloody, sorry, mind my French, you've got this weapon that's, that's a, a metre and a half in length, right, against a little, um, against a little weapon, the Asagai, that the, the Zulus have, right? I, I, if you're good at using the Asagai and, and you've been trained and trained, that's much better than a bayonet. It really, really is. So the other high status weapon uh, was the lance used in attacks by mounted men at arms. The force of a galloping horseman concentrated through the power of a lance gave it incredible power, but it was a one shot weapon, often shattering on impact and was no use by uh, up in close combat. It was individually deadly, but not a war winner. So in other words, again, Dave, what did I just say? If you were good at using a lance, you could win a battle. But if you weren't good at using a lance, you'd you lose were it. Say that again? You would lose it. You, you would lose it. You, uh, well, ba basically, if, um, you know, if you were good on a horse, you could win any battle. But if you were bad on a horse, you would uh, a horse was no good to anyone, right? It's as good as the person riding the horse, not the horse itself. The horse is not the weapon. The, the lance is not the weapon. It's the individual using the weapon is the weapon. It's how they use it is the weapon. Yeah? Now, can I just... Um, yeah. I, um, April, April the 16th, the year is... 1746 it's the battle of culloden and at the battle of culloden over against a well-trained british army now if those because they basically say oh you know the um the jacobites on the side of bonnie prince charlie they ran into battle going oh i got a sword i got a sword i got a sword if they had gone into battle against the British soldiers, knowing how to use that sword, the British army would have been wiped out of Culloden. I've got no doubt about it. After the Battle of Culloden, Bonnie Prince Charlie still had 6,000 men with arms. And, and um, they looked, um, um, the um, Lord Murray, um, with Bonnie Prince Charlie and, the, and their, French uh, their French allies, looked at the army and said, you guys cannot defeat the British army because you do not have the training of the British army. If you had the training of the British army, you could defeat them. But they did not have the training. It's all about using weapons and not numbers. This is the point. And the other thing as well is I would say you could disagree with me on this, Dave, but the Germans lost the Second World War towards the end because they did not have the experienced soldiers to do so. For example, those that were going into the plains, well, no, Germany could not have won the war um, in 1944 and 1945, but they, they, could have, they could have forced the Russians into a stalemate, right? If they had the trained yeah. soldiers towards the end of the war that they After had they in the at that time when it should run. Uh, well, do you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to disagree with you. I would say um, half of their troop were children but also a quarter of their troop were people over 60 or 70. So in other words, only a small proportion of the army, you are right actually there, Dave, um, only a small proportion of the army were actually proper soldiers at that point. And actually, 
you, you, you've taken me onto a tangent. Those defending Berlin at the end of the war, there, there, there was um, in April, um, when, um, when we got the Sea Lauer Heights in, in April, um, the middle of April, um, three weeks before um, the Germans surrender on the 8th of May, um, 110,000 um, German soldiers were on the front line against a million Russians, right? And I'm told there was something like 50 tanks versus a thousand Russian tanks. It was something really silly. Most of those 110,000, as you're right, were either children, were SS soldiers who were not used to fighting in this type of combat situation. Um, soldiers who were at the um, so soldiers who were in the Volstrom um, that, that were retired veterans. They had no chance. But if those 110 had been the same soldiers that had invaded France at the beginning of the Second World War, they would have kept the Russians out. I've got no doubt about it. But they didn't because they, they, they just didn't have the training. In fact, uh, the German soldiers, the German army just folded. There were some really well-trained soldiers that wasted their lives trying to defend Berlin. But, um, but they, they, were just, they were just a wipeout situation. You're right. So here we go. We, 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 we've, um, we, we, we mentioned about these axes and these maces and the spears. Um, those swords became widespread. Uh, pole arms or pole axes, as we've said, um, poles with axes on, um, were, were prevalent with the ordinary arm, with the ordinary infantry. And if, 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 you could, if you could use a pole axe, as I said, you could win a battle. In a defensive block, you kept you keep together. While the spear was the most common uh, weapon, the pole arms, axes, and blades on the ends of long wooden shafts were the weapons. An axe, um, an axe um, was a pole uh, fitted with a heavy um, head made of a stone, stone, I don't know, uh, iron, bronze, or steel, right? And uh, basically. Um, it's said in Switzerland, for example, this is a rather interesting one. Um, uh, the, 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 the Switzerland itself was a country in Europe that, that seems to um, survive throughout the ages. Um, and even yeah, they, the, don't go to war, uh, they? they don't go to war and people seem to respect them. If, if we look at a, if we look at a, a Swiss soldier, here we go. I wasn't going to do this, but um, a Swiss parade soldier. And there's something very interesting about this. I'm hoping it's going to show the right Swiss parade soldier. Uh, th these are like the, the ones like, um, um, hang on, Swiss parade soldier. Oh, I'll go with, oh, no, okay, traditional. Um, traditional. It's no, oh yeah, the Swiss guard. What, what am I doing? It's called the Swiss guard. Here we go. Um, Swiss guard. Yeah, these ones. Look what they've got. They've got a pole axe. That was, um, like, I thought they were, like, guard the Pope. Ah, yeah, the Swiss guard would, would uh, protect the Pope, but, they, um, but um, they're yeah, based they on the traditional... Yeah, they're based on the traditional uniform from Switzerland. Yeah. Look at them. They're still used as ceremonial weapons, but that is deadly. That is deadly. That's going to kill you. Uh, these these guys know how to use that weapon, right? And if you don't have, if you, they've also got a sword with them. Um, but if th they came across a British soldier with a sword and not a, not a, not a gun, uh, these guys would win because they know how to use them. That itself is a very very deadly weapon. In the right hands, mind. In the right hands. Now. What we've got, we've got, uh, it, it's, we've got the trebuchets, shays, and guns. We're gonna, we're gonna look at that, right? So what we've got now, we, we all know what a crossbow looks like now, and a long bow. Now, long bones, long bows in in Wales in particular, uh, people your age would have been trained to have used a long bow for at least five years. You'd been, you'd been, you, you would been experts in using a long bow. Now, longbow practice had been the long age thing that was the, the done thing in Britain for many generations before the um, Owen Glendora revolt of 1399 to, to 
um, about 1409, 1410. Um, what happened, there was the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. And the longbowmen had been used to such effect against Prince Hal, who was the new king, Henry V, that the longbows were used at the Battle of Agincourt because people had been trained in the use of the longbow. There's no point going into battle. Oh, yeah, I forgot you can use a longbow, can't you? Um, yeah, you, you, your dad said you can use a longbow. But yes, um, I can't use a longbow, I can use like a normal one. Oh, go on. You give a longbow a go. Get your dad to get you one. Anyway, well, a, oh, okay. a bow, a bow, a handbow. It's great. Good, good. I'm good, good. But you tr you can use one. You you'd be tell you what, you'd be better at using a longbow against me than I would be using a longbow bow against you because I really don't have the training in one. So you would you would wipe me out no matter how tell you what, if I went out today and bought a thousand pound bow, right? I would I would stand no chance against you because you've used one. I could have state-of-the-art bow, but you can use one. I can't. That's the difference. That is the difference. Three types of bows um, increased the power of medieval archers, giving them more range and capacity to kill. Uh, the recurve bows, the crossbows, and the long bows, right? And do you know what? We know what a crossbow looks like, a long bow, but we, do we know what a recurve bow looks like? Let's have a little look at what a recurve bow Recurve, recurve bow. Here we go, recurve bow. Ah, yes. Is this the type of bow that you've used? Yeah. That's a recurve bow. That's the wow. One yeah. Now, I tell you what, right? I'm sure you'd be pretty good in battle with one of them. But I think the difference between a recurve bow is is that you don't get as many off um you don't get many as many rounds off as if you had a long bow um and i don't know i don't know what the um there we go there's a good old long bow um and again you could probably get more rounds off with a long bow than you could be with the recurve and you get more off with a long bow than you would um uh with a um a crossbow what were you gonna say how do I get more rounds off? Um, let, let me let me let me just uh, have a quick look. There, there we go. Do you know what you've said it now? So ba ba basically, um, let, let's just let's just go through this little description. Yeah, I, I love it. Let's try and answer your question. So we've we've got all these uh, we've got all these. Um, medieval shafts basically you you've got the fletching and the bodkin so the shafts themselves um made of aspen and, and ash they were really cheap to make um and you would have a, a long bowman with a leather glove on there we go um uh, so leather glove um uh, english welsh uh, bowman uh, had basic helmets right to protect themselves they would have a, dog, a dagger and a short sword at this point they, they would have run to the backs of the lines anyway a long bow itself is more is is more powerful than a composite bow a recurve bow um uh, the um the long bow could launch arrows out to 250 yards uh, and it had a range it had a range of heads as well bodkins um do you know what we should do? We should look at the bodkins next week, actually. Um, we should look at the bodkins next week. The bodkins are basically the metal bit on the end, the arrow on the end. Um, and some could pierce um, chain mail. Um, and some could pierce armour. Some could pierce ship um, rigging, right? Because they were used on board ships. We do know that the Mary Rose that went down in... 1546 the mary rose which was henry the eighth flagship we do know that there was lots of longbows on board them because they, they they would have been the weapons of the day um you may have had little wooden barriers set up but you've got an arrange you've got a range of there we go um arrows there and look at those statistics average length of a, a longbow nearly two meters which is taller than you draw weight you've got to really pull them back 
And I think with your recurve, um, your composite bow, um, um, obviously the composite bow is, is, is the equivalent of the recurve in the past. So, yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, okay then, I'm gonna have to, but I'm not gonna go because I'm gonna put my, is it it's showing you my batteries now? Oh my God, that's, that's technology. You're spying on my phone. Effective range up to 250 yards, right? 250 yards, which is actually more effective than a brown bess, which would have been effective at 100 yards, right? Which is, you know, we did the brown bess the other week, the musket. The longbow is more effective. And in many ways, this is why we still, they still, on the American Civil War, on the Confederate and the Union side, this is why they still use Native Americans as archers, because they could be more effective than their own gunmen. Um, there you go, six arrows per minute. So we can um, get off three um, bullets a minute with a brown bess. But you can get six arrows off a minute uh, with a longbow. Can I ask you a question? You know, with your composite, um, your recurve. Now, no, don't exaggerate. Don't overdo it. But how many can you get off a minute? It depends. <laughs> don't don't just just what would you feel what would you feel comfortable with? There's there's somebody with a horse coming towards you now. You've got to kill them. How many can you get off? Six with your seven. You could get six or seven. Yeah. You could yeah, are you serious now? Pretty easy. So maybe I could be a bit wrong. Maybe maybe you can get more off with a recurve than you can with a longbow, right? But I would say that. The longbow is more effective, but we could we could look at that next week and, and um, maybe maybe you could come back at me next week with a few facts in regard to a recurve, uh, which is the equivalent of your composite bow today. Maybe, maybe you could actually come back with me so with some facts, not this week, but next week. Right. So what I'd like to do, right, I would like to get back into where we were looking, right, where, where we were looking and... Okay, wait, wait, have we lost it? No, I think what we need to do, we'll go back and did we, we did, let's see what we've got. I just don't want to see where we were with what we were looking at. Right, okay. Uh, recurve over there. Well, actually, actually, um, strange enough, we come across this quickly. Uh, da, 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 da. Forget it. Oh, we don't want to, no, that's other stuff. Well, I'll leave that for you for next week. So, what I want us to do, um, I've, I've lost what we were doing. Hang on a minute, I've just got to find out. Uh, oh, there we go, that's right. So, we were looking at these bows, we were looking at these bows, we looked at the recurve of the crossbow, even with their extra power, arrows rarely penetrated metal armor, as shown by tests that Br Britain's. Uh, royal armories, but the force of their impact can still incapacitate and shatter morale. Uh, this is the thing. So you've got basically there are descriptions in history that the that the air that the, that, that the sky above you would go black with arrows. So you'd be rained down with arrows. The, the sky would go black. Uh, and then basically daggers. Now I mentioned about, I, I gave you a, an example earlier on about having a dagger, how useful a dagger would be in battle. Well, Dave, a dagger's going to be no good um, um, if you're up against somebody with a sword. But if that person drops their sword and you're good at using that dagger, they are dead meat, as I mentioned earlier on with these ladies in France um, in the Second World War and the First World War, and these ladies in Spain also against the French in the Napoleonic uh, Peninsula War uh, at the beginning of the 1800s. So the point of most weapons was to incapacitate rather than to kill. However, prisoners, especially those of high status, could be ransomed for money, hence the Polacks, with the hammer use rather than the polax with the spear point. But when killing was ordered as on Henry V's orders at Agincourt, the daggers came out. Medieval warriors often carried daggers designed not for cutting, but for punching through the gaps in, in armor. These were used against incapacitated enemies down on the ground. 
as happened to Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth in the year 1485. Um, based on Richard's remains, it's believed that his helmet was cut off with daggers, exposing him to the attackers that killed him. So tribuches, what I'm going to do, we're going to just quickly mention uh, tribuches. Tribuches are, are those wonderful flinging weapons that had been used be, be, before the Roman period, now into the medieval period, to guns. So we'll mention this quickly. We've done a little bit of guns over the past few weeks, but let's just do this one. And we've got a little bit of time then to do some of the stuff that I wanted to do. The assassination stuff. We've got to do that. Medieval warfare was mostly decided by sieges. And here a different sort of weapon mattered. It's referred to as the trebuchet. Um, a weapon was excellent for the siege by flinging rocks repeatedly at a single point. It could hammer a hole in a castle's defences, letting the attackers in. But there, there you go. Look, look at that there. You've got the original uh, rifleman from the late 1400s, basically known as hand cannons, hand guns, later to be known as um, guns. So this, this is an illustration of those rifles, and they were very difficult to fire, and they would usually kill the person firing them uh, than the person that they were being fired at. Um, it's talking still about the trebuchet, the, the, the sort of siege weapon, again, those, those, those great siege weapons that would be put on um, great frameworks. Let's, let's have a li little look at a trebuchet. Let's just sort of put a trebuchet in there. Tre there we go. We now know what a trebuchet looks like. Look at that there. Unfortunately, Dave, you couldn't really carry one of the, them around with you um, into a battle. They they, uh, they were set up um, on a battlefield, usually oh, in a I've got big muscles. Well, have you got big muscles? Yeah. You would say that, wouldn't you? You're just bragging. So... Um, these were what they used before cannons were introduced, right? Now, I know we've done this before, and I think we've done this, the Siege of Constantinople in 1453. Um, they used catapults in the Siege at Constantinople, but they actually started to use cannons. Now, these kind of cannons were vast things, and they would just pound, they would pound a piece of lead shot or a piece or a stone at the walls of Constantinople, and it would just blow a hole through them. Right. So the trebuchets gave way to the great cannons of, of the day. Now, we've got evidence of cannons as, as early as the late 1300s into um, it, when, when, when we look at the uh, 1400s. Uh, we know that they were being used in the old uh, war. <coughs> so here we go. A little bit more traction trebuchets were used from the start of the medieval period. The arrival of the counterweight trebuchet. So basically a counterweight trebuchet was as it fired, it would come back into position. It would go, <coughs> it would go load and it would just come back into place. So you could actually reload it, right? Making even great, uh, great castles vulnerable. In July, 1304, the garrison at Stirling Castle surrendered to Edward I rather than face War Wolf, Edward's massive counterweight tre trebuchet. Do you know what? I haven't seen War Wolf for ages. So let's have a little look at War Wolf. Um, see, see if it comes up straight away. Um, it probably will. War wolf, war wolf. Ah, uh, it says werewolf there. What we've got to do is we've got to put uh, there it is. You can see a little image of it, can't you? Let's just get where war wolf in there. War wolf. Ah, now I don't know if we're gonna have a good one on. Um, now that's pretty big, isn't it? Okay. Look at that. Now, what the reason this? You know, I, I just described that. You you would you would yank it back, and it would go, and you would let go of it. It go, and it go over there, and that counterweight would bring it back into position. So they would just go, it would go, and it would go, it would go. So you'd be able to reload it. So you'd have to have big muscles. That's our war wolf that was used against Stirling Castle. Uh, in uh, 1304. Do you know what? I want a, I want a better image than that. Uh, it, was, it was a vast beast. It was a beast. Are they still around now? What's that? Are they still around now? 
That's the reconstruction of it. Yeah, so that does exist. You can see that. To get your dad to take you to Scotland or wherever that is. But okay. uh, but basically, um, that's a scale model. We don't want a scale model. We want the beast himself. Hang on a minute. Um, war wolf. Um, there's another beast there as well. Oh, God. Uh, which one do we go with? Um, there's a different design there. Um there's actually several different designs there. There's there's um, there's that one that has these massive. Ah, oh, you can push that one along. Um, it's got big wheels on it, but um, yeah, it looks like it's got big wheels on that one. But so there we go. It's got wheels. Uh, how that how that could move, I don't know. But um, the, the principal mechanism, again, the, these are the. These are the mean. The, the, our war wolf is bigger than that one, but it those are normal, big chunky trebuchets. But they're, they're reconstruction ones. There, I wouldn't muck around with one of them, pal. Um, you've got a big bit of lead like that coming towards your defences. You are mint meat. End of the yeah. day, dead. Um, from the 1300s, gunpowder started cha changing war, particularly by the end. And Europeans adapted this Chinese. Um, technology for the new use in guns. One of their first uses was, uh, was at the Battle of Cressy in 1346 when the English fielded five cannons to limited effect. And basically they usually exploded when you fired them, which was no good. Over the next two centuries they evolved into the devastating weapons that would make castles obsolete. The parallel development of handguns was equally important, used in small numbers in the 13 and 1400s. Uh, they were becoming prevalent as the Middle Ages ended. Easier to use than bows, they let rulers field large armies with limited training, increasing the scale of war. Emerging out of the medieval period, they were the weapons that ended the medieval way of fighting. So in other words, Fighting with pole axes and um, swords um, and um, daggers and lances. Suddenly, you've got guns, and and by by the time of the English Civil War or British Civil War, because it happened in Wales and Scotland and Ireland, by the time of the British Civil War um, in the um, early um, uh, 1640s, everyone basically had a gun. When I say everyone had a gun, not everyone had a gun, but most people had a gun. Um, and th this is this is a rather interesting one at the end, a re real strange one. Um, quick lime, um, quick lime is basically you hit up you heat up limestone, right, um, and you get this white dust coming towards you, and it reacts with your eyes, and it basically temporarily blinds you. And it goes, I can't see, and you drop your weapons, and suddenly st uh, stabs you through the chest with a with a with a dagger or a knife. So quick lime, uh, just just sort of have buckets of quick lime um, on a catapult and you chuck it at someone and you chuck it over defences and there you go. Some more unusual weapons do largely get, um, get a notice. The, the caustic salt powder uh, quick lime was dropped on attackers in siege and naval battles, getting through armour and clothing to burn eyes and skin. Um, and also, basically, basically a hand grenade. This is called a caltrop, which we'll actually show you now. The humble caltrop, a spiked metal device, was scattered on the ground to puncture enemy feet or thrown at them. The sharp objects were important enough that it said uh, that a chap by the name of Philip the Good of Burgundy from the medieval period included caltrops is his niece's dowry. So basically, you know, you, you go, you're going to need these if you ever um, go involved in some kind of fight. Unlike many medieval weapons, it is still used today. Scattered across roads by drug gangs to puncture police tyres. So uh, I, I, uh, so here we go. If we type in Caltrop. But guess what? We've got nine minutes left. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the the those, those there is saying that the, those were used in the um, in the First World War um, as anti horse weapons. That that I feel sorry for the horse. Oh, you can actually buy them on the internet for twenty two quid. Flip back. That's a good one, isn't it? Um, that's a cow chop um, from the um, First World War. Hang on, I've just gone off. It is just my screen has just gone off a minute. Hang on. So if we go back there. 
Um, and that, there we go, is a genuine caltrop. Very lethal weapons. There you go, caltrop. Fine medieval caltrop. There we go. These look very deadly, horrible, horrible looking weapons. There we go. There's these caltrops. So there is one slight problem with a caltrop. Uh, there's there's a medi there, there's more of a modern caltrop there. There's one one, one slight problem, yeah. right? And the problem is, is that uh, what what did you just say? Where's a modern one? Uh, we'll, we'll just we'll just show you now. It's um, but you look at the medieval one. The problem is if it if the ground is really muddy, Dave, right? Um, when the soldiers are marched across the lap, the ground, these get embedded deeper in the ground, right? So people just walk over it and they don't get affected, right? That is the problem with this. But on a hard surface, they're deadly, right? So the modern one is simply barbed wire. Are they still legal? Are they, are they legal? Um, no. Um, they, I, I do believe the, these would be against the Geneva Convention as well. But uh, okay. actually, what um, landmines is technically against um, all conventions of war as well. Um, you know, having landmines, the 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 the, um, the Argentinians use landmines in um, uh, in the Falkland Islands in 1982. The um, Iraqis use landmines, uh, usually Russian landmines. Um, in uh, Iraq in 1993, and, and then they'd be like arrested, like you know, you know. Like, well, the thing, the, the first thing is, the first thing is, right? You shouldn't be using them. So, um, you know, if you if you do use them and you use lots of them, you, then if if you are on the losing side, uh, then you might be put on. You you might have to face some kind of trial. Um, like the Nuremberg trials at the end of the Second World War. Argentina um, lost. Also, like, when they should they be on a trial? Say that again. Argentina lost. So, like, shouldn't they be on a trial? Um. Well, yeah, but um, unfortunately, we didn't invade Argentina, and you'd have to act in what's called extradite. You'd have to have said, right, the person who 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 decided that we, you're going to use all these landmines, right? The person who actually decided. Um, needs to be put on trial, and uh, and I do believe I do believe my little grey cells tell me that Galtieri was actually the leader of um, uh, the leader of Argentina in 1982. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna fact check that Galtier Galtieri. Um, if we type in Fal Fal Falklands War, let's just get our facts right. Falklands Falklands War. Here we go. I do believe it was Galtieri. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, Lieb, uh, Poldi Galtieri. And Galtieri, I think, was actually placed on trial by his own people um, in the uh, in the war because... Um, he got his name. There, there he is, Galtieri. Uh, basically, he served as dictator. Um, and um, I do... There he is. He was a military general. You wouldn't muck with him in a, in a dark room. Uh, and here's the Wikipedia entry, and um, yeah, he ended up being placed on trial. There we go, trial in prison. Uh, there we go, uh, usually against his own people rather than. Um, uh, there we go. There, you've got it. The Argentinian Army internal investigation, known as the Rattenbach Report, after the general who led it, recommended that those responsible for the misconduct of the war be prosecuted under the code of military justice. So, in fact, um, not sure about the landmines at all, but Galtieri was actually charged uh, with conduct within that war. Um, in November 1988, the original sentences were confirmed and all three commanders were stripped of their rank. In 1989, Galtieri and 39 other officers of the dictatorship received a presidential pardon. OK, they were let off. Oh, God, we've gone off on a tangent there completely. But... Um, Oh yeah, this, we're, we're, we're definitely we're definitely getting into detail on this one. So there we go. That's a cow crop. And what I want us to do, again, we've missed out the mining bit. What, what we are going to do, right? I want to tell you about an, the assassination attempt on Winston Churchill in 1943. We're going to do one assassination attempt. And do, do you do you know what, right? 
I, I, you can't look this one up, but I, I don't think you're going to get the right answer, right? Um, so I'm just going to make sure that I've, I've not that one there. Um, we're going to do that there in a moment. Um, um, what, what I'm going to say is, is this, right? What I'm going to say is this. Um, did did uh, Mussolini, Churchill, or Stalin, or Hitler, which is the one who had more assassination attempts against their life? Stalin. Hmm. Over probably over probably because Stalin lived longer than Hitler. But when you look at the muscle of the Second World War, between 1922 and 1944, the Stauffenberg plot in 1944, 20th of July, um, Adolf Hitler had 42 assassination attempts against his life. 42, which is quite a lot. We don't know about all the assassination attempts against Stalin. We don't know them all against Hitler, but Hitler was the one who comes out uh, on top. So what we'll do, we'll just we'll just look at this quickly. And uh, I, I thought this was absolutely amazing. I didn't know this until I looked at it today. Nazi commandos came appallingly close to assassinating Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt at the um, November summit to discuss what was going to happen in the war in 1943. It was, it was in Tehran, um, in Iran. A crack squad of Nazi assassins who took part in a do or, or die raid on a war to uh, World War II summit in 1943 came close to killing Winston Churchill. Um, it was a meeting to decide what was going to happen at D Day um, on the 6th of June 1944. Hitler had been forewarned and ordered a team of specially trained commandos to carry out the mission which a new book claims very nearly succeeded. 42 Nazi elite soldiers armed with bombs and submachine guns parachuted into allied occupied Tehran, Iran in November 1943, where their leaders were meeting for the first time. There they are meeting at a table, having something nice to eat. Um, there, um, and there we go. That guy there is Otto Skorzeny, right? Otto Skorzeny was the man who was the leader of the commandos who was going to take out um, both Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin, right? Now, this guy, Skorzenski, was, was, was a man who knew how to fight. This guy had captured, as part of a group of commandos, Mussolini away back from, because Mussolini was, was imprisoned, um, and he actually got Mussolini back. Uh, Mussolini back in charge. This guy was a great commander. Uh, so killing the big three would have dealt a catastrophic blow to the Allies. Uh, in a book called *The Night of the Assassins*, it it was it was gonna it nearly succeeded. It wasn't only their lives uh, in danger, but the whole future of the war. And the plot came shockingly, appallingly close to succeeding. New evidence about the raid uh, is uncovered in declassified documents. The summit was supposed to be top secret. But Churchill let slip, um, let slip in a um, in an announcement, right? Churchill let slip that um, he was going to meet Roosevelt and Stalin. Um, therefore, all Hitler needed to do was to send out his chief spy, um, Schleinberg, to find out where this summit was actually taking place. So they found out it was actually taking place in Iran because there was a German spy uh, at the, um, who was working for the British ambassador in Turkey. Hitler asked personally General Skorzeny, Otto Skorzeny, to lead the attack. Um, known in the West as the most dangerous man in the world, he had previously led a daring raid to free Benito Mussolini and it succeeded. Skorzeny wanted to be the uh, one to put a bullet in the head of Churchill. A general put in the bullet. He would have died, undoubtedly, uh, even if he'd killed um, Churchill. However, um, he wanted to be the one doing it. Uh, it was going to take place on the on the 69th birthday of Winston Churchill, November the 30th, 1943. They were going to meet. They were all going to have a meeting there. It was known as the Tehran Conference. And that's what the German commandos looked like. 
they were well equipped. A German spy discovered an unguarded secret entrance into the heavily fortified embassy compound through underground water tunnels. The Nazi murder squad planned to parachute all 42 of them wearing Russian uniforms and mingling with Soviet troops. Why However, didn't some bomb, bomb the place? It was too far for, um, uh, for German bombers to get to at that stage. German bombers at that co um, quality and capacity didn't come around until 1944. And this was the only opportunity they could do it in November 1943. But the Germans were unaware that two of their operatives were double agents. So in other words, two of their own men told the Russians, told the Russians. The first team parachuted into the desert outside Tehran, but they were ambushed ambushed by Russian troops and they were all killed. A second team was arrested at in Tehran. None of the bodies were ever found. However, six of the commandos survived. Skorzeny, who hadn't landed at that stage, he was going to land, he was going to join his men, uh, saw the element of surprise had been lost. But he had no idea, Dave, that there were six, six German commandos still in um, Iran, and they were going to carry this out, who landed 30 miles off course. So the Russians didn't know where they were. They evaded capture. The six commandos hid uh, in a Tehran gymnasium, but were betrayed by an Iranian wrestler who overpowered them. However, the, uh, the Iranian uh, wrestler uh, wasn't able to keep um, the six German commandos for too long and they escaped. There's Skorzeny, pictured. Um, and there he was. He, he was the one. Uh, uh, he did not parachute in. Um, he was going to parachute in, but he, he thought it was over. But these six commandos were on their way to kill Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill. It's they like like, so they can't do the parachute women. Couldn't they have, like, brought the bomb to? Ah, you, you've jumped ahead because they did. Um, they quickly learned um, a captured German spy had disclosed the plot. So they didn't go in via the tunnels. Forced to adjust their plan, they decided on a suicide attack, bombing the big three when they left for Tehran Airport. Shockingly, the commandos were betrayed again. And when surrounded by Russian troops, they blew themselves up. They had a bomb with them. They could have done it. Some historians have claimed the raid was really a piece of Soviet uh, propaganda, but it wasn't. It did actually take place. The plot would have succeeded if the Russians hadn't killed most of the commando force. And if a captured spy hadn't disclosed the scheme in the last minute about the bomb at the airport to, um, and... You're talking about the water uh, tunnels into the uh, uh, embassy. German commandos would have burst in on Churchill's birthday party and they would have killed him. It would have changed the face of the war and possibly reshaped the world for years to come. On that note, um, I'm done today. So are there any questions? No. Excellent. So anyway... Um, if there's no more questions, hopefully you'll be joining us next week. Um, Stav yeah. will be there next week. Um, and uh, anything else you want to say before we finish? Right. When's the next time we can use your computer? Uh, right. The next time will be next week, it should be. Right. Yeah, I, I know because you want to you want to you want to put Shunak, Shunak on or whatever, but, but Stav's got to be on that one. And we'll give it a go, okay? Okay. Anyway, if there's no more questions, uh, Dave, I'll see you next week. Goodbye. Okay, Take care, Dave. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks for everybody watching. That was with me and Dave. A, a few nice bits of assassination stuff there and medieval warfare. Now I've got to get out. I've got to deal with loads of stuff, wind turbines and stuff. Don't forget.